this picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Shalom and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Josh Weiss and today you might be surprised what we talk about. Here in a moment, my dad, Dr. Randy Weiss, is going to share an entry from his journal with you. This specific journal entry talks about, well, I better just let him explain. A message in support of the King James Version of the Bible. This particular message is about Samson. And you may have heard many messages about Samson, but you've never heard a message about Samson quite like this one. A lot of us are familiar with the famous account of Samson killing a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. Some might say they had jawboned with a few asses before. I'd say that to say such a thing would be an inappropriate saying but I must simply say what my Bible says. Samson, and I quote, found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. What's up with that new jawbone? I probably shouldn't have said it exactly like that because other modern translations say it slightly differently. After all, who says therewith? anymore. But it is totally expressive because it was there with the jawbone of a new, never used ass that Samson whacked a thousand angry enemy soldiers. They had brought Samson to justice, tied in heavy ropes, and he was to be publicly executed. After all, just days earlier, Samson had killed a whole mess of Philistines in an angry fit of rage. And Samson's revenge slaughter was described by the translators of the King James Version of the Bible in unmistakable terms. You see, Samson was furious at the Philistines because they had burned his wife and her father to death. That's never a good thing. And Samson declared his intention to go find and kill him some Philistines. And he said, quote, I will be avenged, unquote. And I quote, and then he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Let me tell you something, buddy. When you've been smote both hip and thigh, you've been seriously smote. And that's the kind of smoke that's leaving a mark. And that's the reason the translators called it, and I quoteth, a great slaughter. Oh, yeah. This wasn't no medium slaughter. Samson was being convicted of a great slaughter. Now, I haven't checked all the modern translations, but I'm pretty sure one probably said it was a super-duper slaughter. You see, Samson was really, really, really mad. And you'd have been mad too. Imagine if you married a really hot-looking young maiden, and as soon as the wedding feast ended, before your honeymoon, you had to rush off to go pay a gambling debt 30 miles away. And when you got back, your best man had married your new wife. Well, that's exactly what happened to my man Samson. At his wedding party, he'd made a bet with 30 Philistine guys that they couldn't answer a riddle he'd made up. The guys had seven days to figure it out. And they had really long wedding parties back in the day. And by day number four of the party, they knew they were going to lose the bet if they didn't do something. So they secretly let Samson's wife know 
that if she couldn't squeeze the answer out of her soon-to-be new hubby, they were going to burn her and her father and the whole household to death. She tricked Samson into telling the answer. The Philistines won the bet through trickery. And from that situation comes one of the most colorful and descriptive passages in all of Scripture. In fact, the King James Version is so perfect, all four of the more scholarly and more modern versions that I checked translated it almost identically to the King James Version. There's no point in messing with perfection. When it can't be said better, we can just stick with Samson's own words from the King James English. He knew how they won the bet immediately. And Samson said, and I quote, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. Unquote. Well, let me tell you something true. Calling a bride a cow never ends well. But the fellas who plowed won 30 fine linen garments and 30 sets of festive clothing, of which Samson had none. You see, Samson never expected to lose that bet. So, like I said earlier, Samson was mad. And he rushed right out to a nearby town and found 30 fellas in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he killed them, and then he took their stuff and headed back to pay his debt. And he went to his parents' house, and he'd had a very bad day, but it got worse. You see, sometime later, Samson decided to go back and make peace with his bride. He missed his little heifer. So Samson, he just marched directly into his father-in-law's house and told him in no uncertain terms, I quoteth again, I'm going into my wife's room to sleep with her, unquoteth. But her father assumed that after the wedding party disaster, Samson had a bad case of buyer's remorse. And he said, I quote, and this is actually from the New Living Translation, I truly thought you must hate her, is what he said. So I gave her in marriage to your best man. Samson rather calmly told the father of the bride, quote, This time I cannot be blamed for everything I'm going to do. And he went and he caught three hundred foxes. He tied their tails together in pairs and he fastened a torch to each pair of tails. Then he lit the torches and let the foxes run through the grain fields of the Philistines. He burned all their grain to the ground, unquote. Then he put the wrecking ball of his vengeance to work as he, quote, destroyed their vineyards and olive groves, unquote. When the Philistine leaders realized that the local economy had been absolutely ravaged, he investigated the crime and quickly learned that Samson was to blame. And he realized at the core of the problem, you guessed it, it was a girl. The New Living Translation describes what happened next. Quote, the Philistine went and got the woman and her father and burned them to death. Unquote. And as we already know, that was the cause of the, quote, great slaughter, unquote, wherein Samson smote them boys hip and thigh. He killed a thousand Philistines with that brand spanking new jawbone of an ass. He spanked them all hip and thigh until they were all spanked dead. Modern translation says, Then Samson boasted, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. But this next line 
is the one that really got my attention and why we're having this conversation. It says, when he finished his boasting, he threw away the jawbone. He threw away the jawbone. I don't get that. Now, you tell the truth. How many of us would have thrown away a slightly used new jawbone of an ass? I mean, think about it. What if the Philistines had called in some reinforcements? I mean, what if he hadn't killed all of them? Of greater concern, if a thousand guys had been killed by that one humble weapon, tell the truth. Wouldn't you have wanted to hang that on the wall? I mean, I'd have gotten it bronzed with a big shiny plaque right on it. With this formerly new jawbone of an ass, I exacted revenge on my enemies and defended the honor of my cheap and untrustworthy fiancé who was burned to death with her no-good father. But Samson just tossed it and went to get a drink because he was thirsty after his great slaughter. So what's the takeaway from all of this? Why are we having this different conversation about Samson? Well, the very next thing that the Bible records about Samson is that he bounced from one Philistine girl to another, and he apparently had a thing for hookers. Samson, who was otherwise one of Israel's greatest heroes, and I quote, went to the Philistine town of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute, end quote. Bad behavior makes the local news, and it makes the news much faster than one's good deeds. You think about that, my friend. I'll repeat it because I want to make sure you get it. Bad behavior makes the local news much faster than one's good deeds. Word of Samson's indiscretion spread faster than varmints with their tails on fire. And everyone probably knows the outcome of Samson and Delilah from the Red Light District. Samson blabbed the secret of his strength to another lady. This time it was to Delilah, the prostitute. She sold more than her body. And when Delilah gave the green light to Samson's enemies, they paid her 28 pounds of silver. Samson lost his hair, his eyes, his power, and then his life. So, the takeaway is important. And I, I hope it's memorable. I, I hope you remember this conversation about Samson and, uh, and even the King James Version of the Bible with all that smote hip and thigh and plowing another man's heifer. There are five things in what I will call this takeaway. Number one, some gals can't keep a secret. Number two, never call a bride a cow or trust a hooker. Number three, I still love the King James Bible. It's a classic. Number four, if you must burn a field, there is no greater accelerant than Firefox. And number five, even a great man with a great calling can lose his way if he runs with the wrong woman. Till next time, shalom, and please don't hate me. Well, that was a fun one. Don't ask me how his journal entries turn into that kind of thing because I don't even know myself. But next up, we're going to listen in to the part of the conversation between my dad and our friend, Dr. John Cathcart. John's been a ministry partner with Crosstalk for a very long time. He's helped us specifically with our Today with God efforts in India. And if you want to learn more about that, you can always visit us on our website, crosstalk.org. The conversation you're about to hear took place in our studio about a month or two ago. 
right behind me actually. We, uh, we had John come so that we could let him share with us, our ministry staff, and so that we could share some Today with God updates with him. And so he spoke with our ministry team and gave some encouragement. Although you won't see them, the Crosstalk team was in the room listening to the conversation live. It was intended for us. But like I said, we wanted you to get a chance to get something out of it as well. There's a lot of gold in what John's about to share, so I encourage you to pay close attention and maybe even take some notes. You never know what God wants to teach you today. John, do you have a word for, for our staff, our friends, our supporters, those who are praying for us, those who care about reaching India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, the region, Nepal, the gospel is, is necessary there. Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Islam dominates many parts of this region of the world. Well, you know, I, I can tell you a few things I've learned. My father used to say, some people go through life wishing their life away. I wish this, and I wish that, and they wish their life away. Don't wish your life away. You know, as John Lennon of the Beatles said, that life is what happens to us while we're busy making other plans. That's something to think about. Life is what happens to us when we're busy making other plans. Never wish your life away. That's a terrible thing to do. Don't be afraid to go for it. Amen. Don't be afraid to go for it. The only people that don't make, make mistakes are the people who don't do anything. You're going to make mistakes. And you'll learn more from your failures than you learn from your successes. But go for broke, as the Japanese used to say. Go for broke. I remember when I was in industry, I was in a th part of a think tank and one of my associates was a PhD in chemical engineering and uh, our supervisor was a, what, a man who became very famous, Bob Rimkus. And I remember Bob saying to Tom, I won't give his second name, he's probably not alive anymore in any case, but he said to him one day, Tom, for God's sake, do something, even if it's wrong, okay? Go for it. Don't be afraid to go for it. Will you crash and burn sometimes? Of course you will. But go for it and don't be afraid to go for it. Now, for your staff, I'd give in the relationships with each other and their relationship with you. Let me give you the golden rule of corporate life. Keep your supervisor apprised, okay? There's an interesting thing about the flow of information. As it ascends from the grassroots up, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower because people filter out the things they don't want the people at the top to hear. But as stuff comes down, it's expanded on, it's expanded on, and expanded on. So be, be careful, but keep your supervisor apprised. They don't like any surprises. I had a friend that was a manager of a big refinery, and when he met with his management team every morning, he would say, okay, give me the bad news first. Give me the bad news first. So keep your supervisor apprised. Don't let him get surprised. And don't live vicariously. Don't try and relive your father's life 
and don't try and live your life through your children. Some people try to live out their frustrations through your children. Give it up. Don't do it. Now, <clears throat> WME has spawned more ministries in India than I can shake a stick at. And I think in writing to you, I, I quoted uh, the words of Isaiah, where the Lord said to Isaiah, or rather, he's saying to Israel, the children which you shall have after you have lost the other will say in your ears, the place wherein we dwell is too straight or confined for us. Give us place that we may dwell. And then Isaiah said, you shall say in your heart, who has begotten me these? We have spawned ministries that we couldn't possibly take care of. Let them go. That's how it works. Uh, let them go and let them proliferate and let them expand and let them spin off other ministries. The, the point is getting the gospel done, not riding herd on your part, part of the flock. Can't ride herd on sheep in any case. And don't ever live in the past. Live in the present. What, live in what the theologian Paul Tillich called the eternal now. You know, Randy, I feel for people in the world. I really do. I lost my grandparents. I lost my aunts and my uncles. They were from Scotland and Ireland. I lost my parents. I lost two wives that I loved. I lost a son, Rick. You remember Rick. And I have suffered terrific loss. But you can't live looking over your shoulder. You've got to live in the present. And through the strength and power of the Lord, you can. So whether it was happy or whether it was unhappy, maybe you had a wonderful past. Some people do. I never did, but that's all right. But don't live in the past whether it was happy or unhappy. As Paul said, forget those things that are past. As my oldest brother used to say, that's all you can do about it. You, you can't do anything about it. Forget those things that are past and press on to those things which are before. So don't live life looking over your shoulders. Forget the past. And another thing is keep a broad view but stay very focused. Now that sounds contradictory. You know, our friend Dr. Londeal, brilliant man, PhD, speaks some Chinese dialects. I think he's the only one in the United States speak. He's an expert in some remote dialect. But stay focused. Be broad-minded, but stay focused. You know, my father used to say, They have their vision, and we have ours. And don't get sucked in to other people's vision and into other people's calling. God has called you for a specific purpose. Let other people that God has called... I'll give you an example. Our chaplain at WME one day was getting all worked up about the LGBTQ thing. I said, Richard, drop it. Drop it. That's not our job. God has people that if that's their area to be concerned, they'll be concerned. 
But our area is to get the Word of God out, get the gospel out, and not be drawn aside by any red herrings. Now, let me tell you something else. And this is worth remembering. Better. I used to have an engineering associate, fantastic man. And one of his sayings was, better is the enemy of good. Think about that. Better is the enemy of good. We can always do something better. Write a better paper, preach a better sermon, do a better job. And while we're waiting to get better, nothing gets done at all. Better is the enemy of good. I agree. Okay. You can always update later if you get the opportunity. Let's say something else. Be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. Shakespeare, Act One of Hamlet. This above all, unto yourself be true. And if to yourself true, then to nobody else can you ever be false. Be true to yourself and you can't be false to anyone else. Integrity is what we do when nobody's looking. Live a consistent life. Live it. You're the only gospel that many people will ever see or hear. I have affected the lives of men I didn't even realize I was affecting. But they said, we watched you and we saw how to become involved in good works. I, I had no idea they were watching. Oh, think again. They're watching you like a hawk. So remember, integrity is what you do when no one's looking. Unfortunately, we're out of time and we have to take a pause on this conversation right there. So we will hear the rest of John's thoughts in the next episode. If you want, make sure that you don't uh, miss out. You can follow us on social media. Look for the, the handle at Crosstalk TV. And I highly encourage you to visit our website, crosstalk.org. If you'd like to donate to us, we would very much appreciate that. And uh, you can do, the, do so on the website or by calling 1-800-688-3422. We don't do this for the money, but we do rely on generous contributions to make these, these programs possible. And so we thank you in advance for what you might do. And until next time, shalom and God bless.